two guys are out hunting in the woods one day when they stumble across a big, deep hole in the ground. The first guy peers into it and says, man, that looks really deep. I can't even see the bottom. The second guy says, it sure does. I tell you what we're going to do. Let's throw a few rocks in there and see how deep it is. We'll kind of hear how long it takes for the rocks to, to hit the ground. So they pick up a few rocks and little rocks and they throw them in there and they wait and they wait. They don't hear anything. Absolute silence from the hole. The first guy says, well, let's get something a little bit bigger. So they, they, they go over and they find a couple rocks that are about the size of a football and they, they heave those in and they're listening and they're listening and they don't hear anything. So they look at each other in amazement and they're like, surely there's got to be a bottom. It looks like a bottomless pit, but there's got to be a bottom. So they look over and in the weeds they find this large railroad tie. And so they said, hey, let's get this in there together. Let's pitch this railroad tie into that hole, and, and surely this thing is big enough where it will make a sound. So they walk over to the hole. They, together, they grab this railroad tie. They, they throw it into the hole, and it, there it goes. Suddenly, out of nowhere, a goat appears running like the wind. It rushes toward the two men, right past them, and jumps right smack down into that hole. The two men look at each other with a baffled look on their face. They said, man, we got to get out of here. This is too strange. I don't know what's going on. So they head back to their truck, and when they get back to their truck, there's an old farmer coming down the road on a tractor. He stops, and as he's looking at the hunting rifles, he says, hey, guys, do you have any luck out there today? And the first guy says, no, sir, we didn't have any luck, not today. The farmer says, what a shame. Hey, but i got to ask you, did you guys happen to see my goat when you were out there? The men look at each other. Their eyes get big. The second guy says, well... Actually, sir, we did see a goat, but we've got some bad news for you. There's a large hole out there in the woods, and your goat jumped right down into that hole. The farmer looks at the men and says, nah, it must not have been my goat. I got my goat chained to a railroad tie. <laughs> <You get it? laughs> some of you got it. It took you a little while, but you got it. <laughs> you have something to tell your buddies at work tomorrow. Amen. Okay, the first weekend of August, we started a series that we were calling Redeeming the Time, which is primarily focused on Ephesians chapter 5, verses 15 through 17. Paul says this, Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time, because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Is. And so we're going to wrap this, this series. It was just a short series. We're going to wrap it up today. And then as we head into September, we're going to un re-unpack the vision that I laid out for you way back in 2018 called Vision 2040. Most of you were not here in 2018. This is a complete different church than we were in 2018. So many of you have not had an opportunity to hear this vision. It is a vision that I believe that God has given to this church that would not only impact but change our city. And we have already seen a lot of that come to pass. We've made great strides towards the fulfillment of this vision. It's a big vision. And I, I think people, when I first laid this out, I think people thought I was nuts. There's no way it would ever come to pass unless God showed up. Kind of like the bus that we need right now. It's not going to happen. God has to work a miracle or it's just not going to happen. But we serve the miracle working God. I've seen it before. But here we are, we're a few years into this vision now, and just look at what God has done. The miracles that we have seen. You have to understand, just in our food pantry alone, which was part of the vision, we are giving away millions of dollars worth of food every year. We are feeding, th and we're not paying for that. We are feeding thousands and thousands of people, and that's just a small part of the vision. We haven't even scratched the surface yet. It's a big vision but we serve a big God, and I believe, as the Bible says, with God, all things are possible. Not just some things, but all things. So I'm going to be reteaching this vision, um, not only to educate you on what the vision says, but it's my prayer that you're going to start believing yourself that with God, all things are possible possible, to get you to dream bigger than you ever have dreamed before for your life, a dream so big that it will change this world for the glory of God. I want you to know that God didn't create you to just simply collect a paycheck and then die one day. I know that's what it feels like sometimes. Some of you are saying, yeah, I, I feel like that, but I believe God created you for a special purpose. 
He created you with a plan in mind. You are not a mistake. As a matter of fact, Paul says in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10, he says, we are God's, you are God's masterpiece. You are God's masterpiece. So that's what's coming next, Vision 2040. I'm actually going to have my wife kick it off. She's got a great message on miracle territory. Okay, if you have your Bible or Bible app, go ahead and turn to Mark chapter 1, verse 29. We use this same passage um, when I began this series back the 1st of August, but we're going to use the same passage today, but we're going to come at this from a different angle because there's a great truth uh, that we didn't get to talk about last time. All of today's notes can also be found in the YouVersion Bible app if you're utilizing that. Here we go. Mark chapter 1, verse 29 said, After Jesus left the synagogue with James and John, they went to Simon and Andrew's home. Now Simon's mother-in-law was sick in bed with a high fever. They told Jesus about her right away. So he went to her bedside. He took her by the hand and he helped her sit up. Then the fever left her and she prepared a meal for them. That evening after sunset, many sick and demon-possessed people were brought to Jesus. The whole town gathered at the door to watch. So Jesus healed many people who were sick with various diseases and he cast out many demons. But because the demons knew who he was, he did not allow them to speak. Verse 35, before daybreak the next morning, Jesus got up and went out to an isolated place to pray. And this is what we talked about in week one. Later, Simon and others went out to find him. When they found him, they said, everyone is looking for you. Verse 38, but Jesus replied, we must go to other towns as well, and I will preach to them too. This is why I came. So he traveled throughout the region of Galilee, preaching in the synagogues and casting out demons. I'm calling this message this morning, The Right Yes. Father, for the next few moments, I ask that you would give me the mind of Christ. God, that you would give me your anointing to deliver this important truth from your word, God. Father, I believe this will be life-changing for some of us. And so, Lord, I just pray that you would speak through me, Lord. If you do not anoint me, these words will fall flat. They will mean nothing. But, God, if you anoint me, these words will change lives. And so, Lord, I thank you for that, all for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. I have a short video I want you to watch. I am proof that hard work, <clears throat> undying faith, and a solid support system, dreams do come true. I like to say I was born with a ball in my hands. Uh, my father played in the NBA, and I was born in the mix of all of that. Oh, by catching. Oh, wow, was he upstairs. I was born with a hearing disability. My mom and dad found out when I was three years old. It really wasn't until third grade that I realized that I was different than everybody else. I got made fun of every single day for my big brown box hearing age, and I was also born with a speech impediment. It was different growing up, but that's really where sports came. So my dad was our coach. My sister and I were on an all-boys team. Sports was an avenue for me where I could play, I could go out, and I could do and, and train and practice and get really, really good at something. Seventh grade was when I made the first goal that I wanted to play in the NBA. The WNBA wasn't around. In the mix of all of that, my mom and dad started having problems in their marriage and ended up getting divorced. That was kind of my aha moment in a lot of different ways. It was the first time having to live without my sister, who, because of my speech impediment and because of my hearing disability, had become my crutch. So I had to learn how to have my own voice. I had to learn how to make my own friend and just become my own person. I remember going to school every single day, getting made fun of. And I remember just one day waking up and I was like, man, I just want to be normal. One day on, on the way home, I took one hearing aid out, took the second hearing aid out, put it in my hand, turned to the field, and threw it. That was the thing that I needed to do to be able to be normal. So I had to learn how to read lips. I sat in the front row of every single one of my classes, literally went from second grade all the way until my freshman year in college without wearing my hearing aids. When I got to the University of Tennessee, for those that know, Pat Summit is a, she was very intentional in how she was a part of each one of our lives. Pat came up and she was like, hey, Catch, I want to wanna talk to you. She said, I, I really feel like it's time for you to get back into not only wearing your hearing aids, but we're going to get you back into speech therapy. And it was at that point in the moment I was like, okay, here we go. You know, to this day, 
and with my hearing aids and you know now I'm a spokesperson and of course you know especially for the younger ones though that had to deal or are dealing with bullying and are trying to figure out hey like who am I now I'm an example for them while I lost my hearing I gained other things just having that sixth sense you know I, I always say now it's my it was my superpower catchings the steal blocked by catchings catchings is everywhere it's been a blessing to to be able to do all that i've been able to do from that seventh grade little girl to go four years in college get to the wmba 15 years playing four olympic gold medals being inducted into the women's basketball hall of fame being inducted into the naismith basketball hall of fame being able to, to have these opportunities and being able to be an example, have the foundation, impact people's lives, have a voice, and it just, it's just been a blessing. My purpose on this earth is really to impact as many people as I can, and that's what I hope to do. An amazing story. When this young lady, Tamika Ketchings, was in seventh grade, she took a piece of paper and she wrote, one day I'm going to be in the NBA. Now, she didn't write, one day I'm going to be in the NBA to, despite the fact I'm a girl. She just simply wrote, one day I'm going to be in the NBA. The problem was is that the WNBA did not exist at the time and no woman had ever played in an all-man's NBA. But despite that, she said, this wasn't going to stop me. I had every confidence that I could play in this league with the guys. She took that note and she put it on her bathroom mirror where she would see it every day. She was quoted as saying, basketball became another kind of homework for me. If I wasn't at an official team practice, I was outside shooting hoops. That was my routine every day. Even during the summer, I was up, to, up at 7, 7.30 in the morning when other kids were sleeping and I rushed through breakfast so I could get out to the court. Defining such a clear goal empowered Catchings to prioritize her to-do lists. She had a clear and compelling yes that inspired her to say no to other things that were competing for her time and attention. She goes on to say that by the grace of God and through a lot of hard work, my dreams became my reality However, achieving my dreams isn't what matters most. What matters is to excel in the thing that God wants you to do and has made you to do. From the WNBA, she would go on and start an organization called Catch the Stars, which is an organization that provides an opportunity for inner city kids to be positively reinforced through sports and education. She told CBN in a recent interview, she said, God is definitely my savior. He's the one that walks beside me through my ups and downs and the one who keeps me focused on where I'm going in life. He protects me. He provides for me. He guides me and he leads me. Tamika's story is one that demonstrates the power of the right yes. Her ability to say yes to the right things and no to everything else allowed her, despite her physical, the physical limitations that she had, to make a great impact on the kingdom of God, changing the lives of the kids of the inner city. The problem is, for many of us, we say yes to the wrong things. Some of us say yes to too many things, and because of that, we have overcrowded our schedules and we have worn ourselves out because of the word yes. In Mark chapter 1, which we read just a moment ago, Jesus is invited to the home of a woman who is very ill. He walks into her home, he takes her by the hand, and she is miraculously healed. The news of this miracle spreads very quickly, and so we read by nightfall, numerous people have surrounded the house that Jesus is in, wanting Jesus to heal them. As a matter of fact, verse 33 says that the entire town, everyone in this village, was at this home. So Jesus ministers to people well into the evening. We're not certain how far into the evening he ministers to the people, but what we do know is there was at some point they decide we're going to call it a night 
and the people can come back in the morning, that will allow us to get some rest for the evening. Well, Jesus gets up before the sun comes up, and we're told that he goes out to an isolated place before the crowd comes back that morning to pray. We talked about this in week one of the series, silencing the noise of life and getting alone with God. Is this what is required to renew your strength? Well, eventually the crowd returns. I'm guessing probably as soon as the sun comes up, the people are coming back to the house where Jesus is at so he can continue to minister to them, and he's not there. So some people go out and they are looking for him. When they find him in this secluded place, they go up to him and say, hey, Jesus, man, everybody's looking for you. It's time to head back and minister to these people. And when they say that, Jesus responds to them in a very unusual way. And I want you to catch this because this is very often overlooked, but there is a great truth here. Look again what he says in verse 38. But Jesus replied, we must go on to other towns as well, and I will preach to them too. That is why I came. So we traveled throughout the region of Galilee, preaching in the synagogues, casting out demons. So these people that are looking for him come up and say, Jesus, it's time to go back to where we were. There are people waiting for you at the house to be healed, to be set free. There, are, there is a good work to do. And Jesus responds, and let me summarize to you what he says. He says, no. No. <laughs> wait, wait a minute, what? No? There are people waiting for you to minister to them, to heal them, to set them free, and you say, no? Now let me ask, are these people of this small village... Are they not as important as the other people that he's going to, to minister to? Does Jesus not care? These people are still sick, but he leaves. The truth is, the people in this small village were very important. They're just as important as everyone else, but Jesus knew there was something greater at stake. Eternity was at stake. You see, the people of this village the night before, the whole village had gathered around. They had heard the message. They had seen the goodness of God firsthand. But there were a lot of people still that had never heard. So he says to those looking for him, guys, we've got to go to the other towns as well, and I will preach to them too. That is why I came. You see, Jesus understood the power of the right yes. He understood that of all the good things he could do were not necessarily the things he should do. The fact is not all yeses are created equal. Not every to-do in our schedule carries the equal weight impacting the kingdom of God. Jesus said no to something good in order to say yes to something great. Here's another example. Let's, we're going to take a look at two different uh, passages of Scripture. Luke chapter 5, Luke chapter 15. We're going to start with Luke chapter 5. Luke chapter 5, verse 27. This is the account of Jesus calling a man by the name of Levi, which would later be changed to Matthew, to be his disciple. Here is what it says. Later, as Jesus left the town, he said, this is Luke chapter 5, verse 27. As he left the town, he saw a tax collector named Levi sitting at his tax collector's booth. Follow me and be my disciple, Jesus said to him. So Levi got up, he left everything right there and followed him. Later, Levi held a banquet in his home with Jesus as the guest of honor. Many of Levi's fellow tax collectors and other guests were there and they ate with them. Now watch this. Now, I want you to watch how the religious leaders respond to Jesus doing this. Jesus is hanging out with a tax collector, which tax collectors commonly stole from people. They were thieves. Nobody liked them. And he's hanging out with the tax collector and all the tax collector's buddies. This is a, this is a bad news group that he's hanging out with. More than likely, the people in this group that Jesus is 
hanging out with. They want nothing to do with God. Verse 30, but the Pharisees, this is the religious leaders, and the teachers of the religious law complained bitterly to Jesus' disciples. Now watch what they say. Why do you eat and drink with such scum? Jesus answered them, (laughs) healthy people don't need a doctor, sick people do. I have come to call those who think, I have, I have come to call not those who think they are righteous. He's talking about the religious leaders. You guys think you're righteous. But I've come for those that know they are sinners and they know they need to repent. Now, with that in mind, let's head over to Luke chapter 15. Luke chapter 15, we read this about the same religious leaders. And they're getting angry with Jesus because he's once again associating with people they would call sinful people or scum as they put it. They didn't like him hanging out with these people. In the eyes of the religious people, listen to me, in the eyes of the religious people, Jesus is wasting his time. So he tells them three different parables. We're only going to talk about the first two. Back to back to back, one, two, three, tells them three different parables, same theme. Luke chapter 15, verse 1. Tax collectors and other notorious sinners often came to listen to Jesus teach. Then the Pharisees and teachers of religious law complained that he was associating with such uh, such sinful people, even eating with them. So they're upset. So Jesus told them this story. If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them gets lost, what will he do? Won't he leave the 99 others in the wilderness and go search for the one until he finds it? Okay, so this first story, he tells the story of a hundred sheep. One of these sheep wanders off, so the sheep is lost. The word lost here, if you look this up in the original Greek language, it comes from the Greek word apolumai, and it means to fully destroy complete destruction. So it's this, this sheep is destined for eternal damnation. This is serious. This isn't just a sheep that's lost over in the next pasture. This is what he's trying to communicate. This word is the same word that's translated perish in, the, in, the, in John 3, 16. Same word. So Jesus is referencing eternal separation from God. This is serious. In other words, this sheep isn't just lost. It is in great danger. It's headed for eternal destruction. The shepherd knows this. And the shepherd is concerned about the condition of the sheep. And so the shepherd is moved to do something to save this lost sheep. And he heads out and looks for it. He says yes to the one sheep. Now this story is interesting in the fact that in order for the shepherd to look for the one lost sheep, it means he has to leave the 99 behind. That means right now you have 99 sheep that are not being attended to. Not only are they not being attended to, but we read that they're left in open country. And if you look at the original Greek for open country, you'll see that it is referring to a place that is solitary, lonely, desolate, and uninhabited. So understand what is happening. When Jesus says yes, or the shepherd says yes, towards the one sheep that is headed towards destruction, the shepherd is saying no to the nether 99. Now, does this mean the shepherd doesn't care about the 99? Absolutely not. The, shepherd are, the, the 99 are just as important to the shepherd, but there, is, but there is only one difference. The 99 are safe. The 99 are secure. The 99 are out of harm's way. With the shepherd leaving, this might put them in a season of discomfort, but they are safe. So the shepherd leaves the 99 to look for the one. Verse 5 says, and when he has found it, he will joyfully carry it home on his shoulders. You'll see many pictures of this where Jesus is carrying one sheep. When he arrives, he will call together his friends and neighbors saying, rejoice with me because I have found my lost sheep. In the same way, there is more joy in heaven over one lost sinner who repents and returns to God than over over 99 others who are righteous and haven't strayed away. When someone says yes to God, there is celebration that breaks out in heaven. 
To drive his point further, he tells a second parable, verse 8. He says, or suppose a woman has ten silver coins and she loses one. Won't she light a lamp and sweep the entire house and search carefully until she finds it? Now, the interesting thing about this parable is the economic status shift of the individual doing the searching. In the first story with the, the guy with the hundred sheep, in, in, in this day, if you had a hundred sheep, you were considered very, very wealthy. So the argument can be made that this woman in the second story is very poor because she only has 10 coins. As a matter of fact, other translations say the coins that she had were drachma. And to show you the value of a drachma before it was replaced by the euro back in 2002, the exchange rate of a one U.S. dollar was 400 drachma. She only has 10. So she loses one. And to find it, she tears the place apart. She tears her house apart. Obviously, this has great value to her. It's worth less than a penny. I don't know how many of us would tear our house apart looking for something the value of a penny, let alone something less. But she doesn't have more sitting in her bank account. This is all she has. To further support this would be she needed a lamp to look to, to be lit to search for the, the coin. In this day, a lamp would be used during the day in a peasant's home that had no windows. So more than likely, this lady was extremely poor. If the guy in the first story loses a, 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 a drachma coin, who cares? We're going on. We've, we've, we've got more. But I believe that Jesus did this to illustrate the importance of that which was lost. Like I said, the, the first guy loses it, life goes on. But if a poor person loses a coin, it's a very big deal now because now they might not eat. Jesus was trying to drive the point home, which is simply this. In both stories, the object being searched for had great value to the one doing the searching. Verse 9, and when she finds it, she will call in her friends and neighbors and say, rejoice with me because I have found my lost coin. In the same way, there is joy in the presence of God's angels when even one sinner repents. You see, the yes of Jesus, the yes of heaven is always for the lost. When the lost are involved, the answer is always yes. And this answer is always the right answer. This yes, when it comes to the lost, in a life of a believer, should trump every other yes in our life. This yes should be priority over everything else in our life. And I believe this is one of the reasons that we have seen God move like he has in this church. All of the miracles that we've seen, because we go after the lost we don't just sit back and play comfortable church and make it all about me and, and my needs and my wants. We go after the one thing that is of utmost importance to God, and that's souls. I mean, we don't have a lot of resources, and God miraculously provides nearly 1,000 backpacks for us to give away last week, and he packs this place out for his glory. Who would have ever have thought that one day we would be packing this building out to the place that we have people sitting out in the lobby, we have people sitting in an overflow room watching the service on a screen? Why does he give us that blessing? Because we're going after the lost. And when you go after the lost, things tend to get a little messy. I get it. But if you want to see the reign of God, you have to be willing to deal with the mud. Because there's always mud after rain. You cannot have one without the other. So let me ask you, what things are you saying yes to? Some of us have difficulty, we say yes to everything, but you need to understand something. Every time you say yes to something, you are saying no to something else. This is very important, and when you begin to think this way, the way you spend your time will drastically change. For instance, I used to be one of them people that I'd say yes to everything. And I said yes to everything because I wanted to make everyone happy, and people like it when you say yes to their request. People don't like to be told no. I get it. 
But as we all know, that's not sustainable. It's not sustainable saying yes to everything. It was killing me. It was robbing me of my peace and my joy. And so I've tried my best to change my mindset from a worldly mindset, which unfortunately is the mindset for most people, even Christians, changing it from a worldly mindset to a kingdom mindset. And do I get it right all the time? No, I don't. But I've come a long ways from where I once was, and that's the goal for all of us, to get better and to become more like Christ every day. So here's what it looks like for me, and I'm going to give this to you as an example, but your situation will probably look much different, but the concept, the truth, is the same. As you can imagine, I get requests from people all the time that want me to join them for something. People want me to do an activity, a recreation activity, ministry activities, you name it. I get requests all the time, and they're all great. None of them are bad. They're all awesome. But I can't possibly do everything. If you're, you, you know that, you, you can't do it either. So with every request that comes my way, I ask myself a question. And the question I ask myself is this, and I really feel like this is going to help somebody. I ask, if I say yes to this request, what am I saying no to? Because the truth is, every time I say yes to something, I am saying no to something else. And so many times we say yes to the wrong things. Satan wants you to say yes to the wrong things. He wants you to be distracted. Let's just get very practical for a moment. Let me give you some practical examples first, then I'm going to give you some spiritual examples. For instance, if we say yes to junk food, we are saying no to our health. If we say yes to working seven days a week, we are saying no to a day of rest. And our body quickly will break down. If we say yes to staying up late to watch another episode of our favorite TV show, which you could definitely do, we are saying no to a productive early morning. If we say yes to hours and hours of gaming, we are saying no to using that same time to invest into our future. Now let's flip it over and talk about the spiritual side. We say yes to watching the television and scrolling through our social media feeds, but we say no to reading the Word of God in prayer. We say yes to our recreational activities, but we say no to being in the house of God. We say yes to our hobbies, but we say no to serving others. We say yes to having the nicest things on the block, but we say no to investing our resources into God's house. We say yes to building the American dream for us and our family, but we say no to building the kingdom of God, which is eternal. And we could go on. And none of these things are bad. But you have to ask yourself, what am I saying no to by saying yes to all of this other stuff? Because for some of us, we are saying yes to worthless things and we are saying no to souls. For example, I guarantee you Satan will distract you with worthless things that matter nothing for eternity on Wednesday nights to keep you from saying yes to being here, being here and investing into the life of a young person. So many times we say yes to things of personal comfort. We like personal comfort, and so that's an easy yes, but a lot of times when we do that, we say no to the eternal destiny of someone's soul. I'm telling you, I could, list a, I could list a dozen people that have left this church because they don't like the fact that we go after the lost like we do. It affects our personal comfort. But can I, I cannot apologize for that. I never will apologize for that because that is the right yes. That is the yes that gets the attention of heaven. And when we say yes to the things that God says yes to, we begin to watch the hand of God move in our midst. And oftentimes we say yes to things that matter nothing for eternity. Look at your day yesterday and ask yourself, the things I said yes to, did they impact eternity? And when we say yes to the wrong things, we say no to the right things. Because with every yes, there is a no. We say no to eternal matters. We say no to the things that can truly make a difference in the life of someone else. 
and impact eternity. Sam, if you could come back up at this time. I'm going to close with this. I want you to imagine a gardener owns a very small plot of land, but they have a vision for this garden to plant beautiful flowers unlike any other in town. That's the vision that they have for this plot of land. So they head down to the local nursery to purchase the seeds to plant their garden that they have a vision for. When the gardener arrives at the nursery, of course, he sees just hundreds and hundreds of seeds lying in the walls, different ones. Hundreds of varieties to choose from. Man, what do I pick? And he starts looking over the seeds, and some of them are for plants that will grow quickly, but then they don't last long and doesn't want that. Some seeds are for invasive flowers that can eventually, a lot of work, and they'll take over the garden if he's not careful, choking out the more desirable plants. So that the, the, the farmer, the gardener, he, un, he understands, I, I can't plant all of these seeds. Because if I plant all of, I say yes to all these seeds, I'm not going to see the vision come to pass. I can't do it. So they must be discerning and say yes to only the right seeds. They have to say yes. Now listen to me very carefully. They have to say yes to only the seeds that will contribute to the vision they have for their garden. So they choose seeds. The, 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 the gardener chooses seeds that will grow into sturdy plants, those that will bear good fruit, and those that will enhance the beauty and health of the overall garden. In the same way, you and I, we all have very limited time. We can, Like I said, we can all make more money, but we, we, we cannot make more time. Once it's gone, it's gone. Our time is limited. Our energy is limited. Many opportunities will come our way, but not every opportunity is going to align for the vision that God has for your life. Just as the gardener carefully selects the seeds to plant, in our life, we have to be wise and we have to be discerning, saying yes to the things that will help us grow spiritually, contribute to the well-being of others, serve others, win the lost, and fulfill God's plan for our lives. What are you saying yes to? I'm going to ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes. Father, we thank you for this word this morning. And I know, God, this is, a, this is a challenging word for us, God. And I have failed at this many times. I have said yes to the wrong things. And in doing so, I have neglected things that are better. And so, Jesus, we look at your example today, God. You said no to something good so you could say yes to something great. God, help us to walk with that same mentality. Help us to keep the lost in the forefront of our mind. Help us to keep people, serving people, helping people in the forefront of our mind, God. Because that's the yes of heaven. So God, we thank you for your example. We thank you for your direction today. Holy Spirit, I just pray right now that you would speak to each and every one right where they're at. God, I ask that you would speak to us of things that we're saying yes to that we should not be saying yes to. God, I just ask that you would speak to your people in Jesus' name. Won't you keep your head bowed and your eyes closed?